When I was a kid growing up in church, I remember learning stories about Moses and the Israelites in Sunday school. Sunday school was a place where we would gather with people our own age and learn stories about the Bible. And I'm a visual learner, so it was really fortunate for me to grow up in a time where we had TVs and screens and lights and worship videos. I'm just kidding. We had none of that. My life, my childhood was marked by overhead projectors and felt boards. And if you grew up around the same time as me and went to church, maybe you experienced the same thing. This is where I learned the stories of Moses, how his mother put him in a basket and sent him down the Nile River to save his life, how Pharaoh's daughter found Moses, and she decided that she wanted to raise him as her own, how Pharaoh then helped Moses learn all the ways of the Egyptians until one day Moses saw an Egyptian man hurting a Hebrew man, and so he killed him. So Moses, now out of shame, wanders into the wilderness where he spent many years before God appeared to him in the form of a burning bush. And this is where he called Moses to lead his people. So then Moses and Aaron get together and they go to Pharaoh and they say, Pharaoh, you have to let our people go. And Pharaoh says no. And so the plagues come and back and forth they go until Pharaoh finally says, enough, I've had enough, get out of here. And so Moses is able to lead his people out of captivity through the Red Sea. And then when they cross to the other side, the Lord provided for them in the wilderness through manna. Then we learn about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and then when Moses comes down from the mountain, he finds that all of his people are worshiping the golden calf. So if Moses had an Instagram account back in the day, his handle might have been Moses Loves Manna, and this would have been some of the things that you would have seen, because these are the highlights, right? That's what we put on Instagram, the highlights of our life, but... There is so much more to learn from Moses in between the highlights and in between the pages of this book. And so we're going to dive in today to a story from Numbers 16. So if you have your Bible nearby and you want to pull it out, that's where we're going to hang out today. So let me give you an overview of what's happening in this chapter. There's a man named Korah who happens to be the cousin of Moses and Aaron. And he is leading a rebellion against Moses. He has gathered all the prominent leaders of their community, which is about 250 plus people at this time. And they've come before Moses and Aaron to say this in verse 3. Moses, you have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord. And he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? So imagine Moses and Aaron, two humble men of God, standing before hundreds of other leaders, listening to the accusations against them. And what does Moses do? How does he react? In verse 4, it says that he fell face down on the ground. Moses begins to pray. Now, I don't remember learning much about Moses and his prayer life in Sunday school. There's no flannel to predict that, but what I'm thinking is it wasn't as glamorous as him parting the Red Sea. But if you look at the story of Moses in between the pages, you see that prayer was an integral part of who he was. He knew that God was holy, and he prayed that he would show his glory He would fall to his face for protection. He would fall on his face and ask for direction. And he would intercede on behalf of others. And he'd ask God for his presence because he knew he didn't want to live without him. The first thing we can learn from Moses is how prayer shaped his life. Prayer comes out of a relationship with God. It's not one-sided. Moses knew that he needed to both listen to and speak to God. God was not a last resort for Moses. Turning to him was his first step. 
So when faced with accusations, Moses responded with prayer. A couple months ago, Drew shared a simple path of prayer that he had learned from the writer, Anne Lamont. And that path is only three words long, help, thanks, and wow. We ask God for his help. In humility, we surrender ourselves and we say, Lord, we need you. We can't do this on our own. And then with grateful hearts, we can look back and see all the ways he's answered our prayer. And we say, thank you, God. Thank you. And as our gratitude turns to praise, we say, wow, only God could do this. And what I want to add to that today is the word now. Because what I have learned from Moses is not to hesitate, to ask for help now. And when God answers my prayers to give thanks now, that we should appreciate the wonder of who God is and how he cares for us now. When we look at the situation that Moses is in, we realize that he responded with prayer immediately. What would happen if we began to incorporate prayer with that kind of immediacy in our own lives? Think of how different our responses might be if we invite God and his spirit to shape our reactions. How would our families look and feel different if we paused and prayed before reacting? Now, I'm not suggesting that every time you are met with a confrontation that someone needs to fall down on their face and start praying to God. It can be a simple prayer like, Holy Spirit, will you come and help me? What if we took a moment and prayed before we posted on social media. Can you imagine how less divisive Facebook would become? And what if we invited God into our conversations instead of just reacting to one another? How much more fruit of the Spirit would we see in each other's lives? See, Moses figured this out along the way. He was once a person who struggled with his reactions, going as far as to kill that man. But God had changed his heart, and now he knew his first response was to pray. In this story, unfortunately, we don't see Korah and his followers living out that same value. Instead, they are putting themselves and their desires first. And this is something that we see happen over and over again in the lives of the Israelites as they take their eyes off God. Remember back in verse 3, they asked Moses, what makes you greater than us? See, they had assumed that Moses had put himself into a position of authority. They didn't realize that God had called and positioned Moses to lead his people. In fact, if you remember the story, then you know that Moses didn't even feel qualified. He said, Lord, I can't even speak. Send someone else, which is why his brother Aaron came alongside to help him. So we have two kinds of leaders here. Moses, a man leading out of humility, seeking God first and shaped by prayer. And Korah, full of pride and entitlement, leading a rebellion against Moses, shaped by power. And that desire for power got a hold of him, and things just began to unravel quickly. As Korah and his followers become more defiant, Moses grew angry, and he basically challenges Korah, saying, okay, if the priesthood is what you want, which is the position his brother Aaron had, then come here tomorrow with your followers, light your incense burners, and present them before the Lord. By inviting them to do this, he was allowing them to behave as priests. But Moses knew the heart of God. He knew all along that God would make clear whom he had chosen to serve as priest. And so the next day, as these men stood with their incense at the tabernacle, listen to what happens in verse 20. The glorious presence of the Lord appeared to the whole community. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, get away from all these people so that I may instantly destroy them. Some of you may hear that and immediately respond with, wait. 
That does not sound like the God that I've learned about that is full of grace and mercy and kindness and forgiveness, but it is. This is the same God, a God of justice, a God of order. He had made his expectations clear to the Israelites. He made a way for them, and they still chose to go their own way. They rebelled against him, so they were about to experience God's wrath. And if you're wondering how can a God of love also be a God of wrath, maybe it would help to understand that word more. God's wrath is not vengeful. It is just. Our understanding of this is just so limited because we can only grasp it from a human perspective. But God is so holy, so completely devoid of sin that this was his response to the rebellion of men. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's beyond what any of us can comprehend. And Moses knew this. After they were delivered from the hands of the Egyptians and they crossed through the Red Sea, he said, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? You are glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders. And Moses also gave us these words in Psalm 90. Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Moses knows the strength and the power of God, and he realizes that these people are not backing down. So when he hears the judgment of God upon these people, he and Aaron both fall on their faces again, pleading with God, saying this in verse 22, you are the God who gives breath to all the creatures. Must you be angry with all the people when only one man sins? Do you hear the concern that Moses has for his people? He understood that God had made a way for them, but they weren't getting it. So now he is pleading with God to save the same ones who are accusing him. He was interceding for people, which means he was coming to God and praying on their behalf. As we look to learn from Moses, a question that I have for us is who are we praying for? As we incorporate prayer into our lives, it's important that we are not only praying for ourselves, but we are praying for others. Start small. Maybe make a list of three names and pray for each one of them this week. Oh, the stories I could share with you about the people who have prayed for me how God listened when they asked for help on my behalf, how I was able to say thanks and wow to God when their prayers were answered. As we look back on this story, we can see that God did answer Moses' prayer, but we also see the justice of God enacted. The earth opens up and swallows the evil men and a fire breaks out. You've gotta read this story, it's crazy. That leads to an even greater revolt against Moses. Now they're blaming him for all that had happened. And so once again, God sees the rebellious hearts of people turning against the ones he has chosen. And so God appears again to tell Moses and Aaron to move out of the way from these evil people. And I wonder if you were in the same situation, what would you do? These people have been coming at Moses for days, and now God appears and says, let me take care of it. Would you say, thank you, Lord, they are all yours, because I'm pretty sure that's what I would say. But that's not what Moses and Aaron did. They fell face down on the ground and prayed. And I picture Moses leaning over to Aaron and saying, the Lord is angry. Take your incense burner and carry it among the people. Atone for them, which means cover their sins. That was his responsibility as the high priest. He was their mediator, the one who would go to God on the people's behalf. And so Aaron, who's over 80 years old at this point, he probably has bad knees and an aching back. He stands up quickly and he begins to run among the people, burning incense and purifying them. And here in verse 48, you can see the verse that captured my heart. He stood between the dead and the living and the plague stopped. When I first read this, 
my heart was so convicted because I could think of so many people in my life who are alive in Christ, which is awesome, and yet so many others who don't know him yet. Am I running towards them with the same kind of urgency that Aaron had because he knew what he carried with him could save their lives? A few months ago when quarantine began, I picked up a new habit. I really like plants. And so my daughter and I would go out and buy some vegetables, some flowers. We'd plant them in our backyard and we'd watch them grow. As I started to get the hang of it, I thought, hey, we should bring this indoors too. It became kind of a joke in my family. Every time I would leave, I'd come back with a plant to the point where my kids say, mom, no more plants. You are becoming a plant lady. But I just love my house filled with plants. But I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I get pretty lazy at taking care of them. There's actually a plant in my house right now, and I am watching it die. It is withering away, and I keep walking past it, thinking, I'll water it tomorrow. I'll get to it later. And I can't help but think how that is parallel to people in my own life. How many people are in my circle of friends who don't know Jesus? How many people are in my neighborhood who don't know Jesus? And I think, I'll get to that later. See, I know what is in me can bring them life, but I'm too busy to talk to them right now. I make excuses. I think, I'll get to that later. And God is saying, no. I want you to run with the urgency of Aaron towards the people. I want you to stand in the gap in the middle of those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ, and I want you to point them all to me. See, I cannot save anyone, but I know the one who can, and his name is Jesus, and he is my rescuer. He stood in the gap between death and life for me and for you. For while we were still sinners... He died for us. He made a way for us. No longer did priests like Aaron need to make sacrifices for our sin because Jesus himself became the sacrifice and by doing so, he became our high priest, the one who mediates for us now, the one who goes to the Father on our behalf, the one who covered our sins once and for all by giving his life. Listen to this verse from the writer of Hebrews chapter seven. Unlike those other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sin. He offered himself. Out of his love for us, God made a way so that we could be forgiven, atoned for, so that we could live in his grace and experience his mercy. That mercy and love is available to each one of us today. Now, some of you watching may not know Jesus yet, but if there is a stirring in your soul that makes you want to know more, I want to encourage you to move towards him. Take your next steps. Around here, we always say, begin with the people that you're with. Maybe you're watching this with friends or through a watch party, and I just encourage you to talk to them. Ask questions. Let them know you want to take a step in the direction of Jesus. And we realize that not everyone is watching church with someone else. So if you're wanting to take a step and need someone to talk to, you can text Join Jesus at 94090 and our team will respond to you right now and begin that journey with you. Now for those of you who follow Jesus, I wanna ask you this question. What is God calling you to move toward? Or better yet, who is God calling you to move toward? Where do you see gaps? Are there people in your life who don't know Jesus? Are you waiting for someone else to tell them about him? 
One thing that I have rediscovered in this pandemic that has shifted my way of thinking is the calling on my life to go and tell people about Jesus. This is the great commission that Jesus invites each one of us into in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples. Don't sit and wait for that to happen. This isn't something that's just reserved for me or other people that work in our church. This is the calling on every person that follows Jesus. A few weeks ago, I met a man named Pete. Pete's a great guy. He leads our ASL ministry here at the church, which is a ministry for deaf and hard of hearing people. And Pete was telling me and a group of others about his friend named Matt. Matt lives in Virginia, but Matt called him and said, I want to come see you. I want to share the gospel with you face to face. And so Pete said, okay. And so Matt flies all the way to Las Vegas to meet with Pete. Do you see the urgency in that? They had a conversation. And Matt begins to share how God has changed his life and the things he's learned and Pete is telling us, I realize that the Holy Spirit is living within me. The Holy Spirit will give me the courage and the boldness that I need to go and tell other people about Jesus. This conversation changed Pete. And as he's sharing it with us, I am just so encouraged. And then Pete says, oh yeah. And just a couple weeks ago, my wife and I got baptized in the Colorado River. It was an amazing story to see how God was moving in Pete's life. He is ready to impact Las Vegas and beyond. So church, what are we waiting for? I wanna encourage all of you this week to take a first step. It doesn't mean that you have to jump on a plane and go to see a friend and share the gospel with them, although that would be awesome. We all need to have somebody like Matt in our life to come and share things with us. But maybe today, that first step is just to begin with a prayer. God, show me who it is in my life that doesn't know you and give me the courage by the power of your Holy Spirit to go and talk to them. In 1 Peter, we read this in chapter two, for you are a chosen people, you are royal priests, a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. And as a result, you, can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Friends, as the world seems to get darker and darker, we have living within us the light of the world, the hope in the darkness, and we can bring life to other people. What would happen if we fell on our faces and we began to pray now? What would happen if we would intercede for people like Moses did, praying for the lost to be found, praying for the broken to be whole, praying for the addict to become clean, for the family to be restored, for the church to come alive and praying for our city to know Jesus? This is not the time to become complacent. Let us not depend on someone else to do the work. Let's run with the urgency of Aaron towards the people, not afraid of what might happen. It is time for the church to rise up. It is time for you as a follower of Jesus to stand in the gap between death and life and point people to your rescuer. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for making a way for us. We thank you for Jesus, for the way that he stood in the gap by going to the cross the way that he experienced both death and life and resurrected and came alive and now we can be alive in him. 
So God, I am praying for an awakening in each one of us, for your spirit to move and work in our hearts today. Tell us what we need to hear. Give us the courage and the boldness to go and to run towards people that need you. Give us the courage to share the light that lives within each one of us. Lord, I am praying that you will do something new in our church, something new in our city. God, move in our hearts. As we point people to you, our rescuer, Lord, we pray that you will rescue the lost, that you will stand again in the gap of those who are dead and those who are alive, and Lord, bring us to life in you. You are the way and the truth and the life, and so God, today we come to you and say we love you, we trust you, we will follow your way, our holy God. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. You are glorious. You are wonderful. You are awesome and you are good. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray together. Amen.